Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. The most important launch of 2023? What the hell is this guy talking about? Starship has had two launches this year. That's a way more important rocket than Vulcan Centaur. Oh yeah, I get it. The reason he thinks this is the most important launch of 2023 is because he doesn't want to get an ugly tattoo on his... Good afternoon once again. Welcome to the Angry Astronauts. So we are less than a month away from what I'm billing as the most important launch of 2023. And I'm sure just about all of my viewers disagree with me on that, but hear me out. If Starship were to have an RUD on its way up to space, which it did, Twice. Well, actually, to be fair, the RUD the second time happened after it passed the Kármán line. Well, it's not that big of a deal. It's actually considered to be part of the process for SpaceX. Vulcan Centaur is a fully mature system, and it's a system with every component that's been tested to failure, which means it's expected to launch properly the first time. And given all of the delays that ULA has experienced in trying to get this rocket ready to go, they can't afford any test flights. They have to go now with a paying customer on board, a very important and critical NASA paying customer on board. Well, to be fair, there's a lot of NASA payloads, but uh, this is actually a private customer and a very critical one at that. As a matter of fact, it's a customer that's decided to go with SpaceX with future launches because of all of the time it took ULA to get Vulcan Centaur ready to go. And if anything goes wrong with this launch, there are going to be so many consequences, not just for ULA, but for many other spaceflight-related companies as well, and the U.S. military, and NASA, well, hell, just about everybody. This launch absolutely needs to go as planned, and not just because my ass is literally on the line. So let me start out by saying the first outrageous thing that I'm going to be saying in this video, and that is Vulcan Centaur has the potential to be the most versatile rocket in service for the next several years. Why is this the case? I mean, the thing isn't even reusable to start off with. Well, again, I say potentially because there is reusability built into this in the long run. First of all, the upper stage, once known as ACES, now known as Centaur 5, is a far more versatile and advanced upper stage than many of ULA's competitors. Not only can this thing relight several times, it can also deploy payloads into multiple orbits. That is to say, it could deploy something into low Earth orbit first and then send a payload all the way to the moon later on. Very few rockets are capable of doing this in a single launch, but Centaur 5 is capable of doing that. And of course, we're looking at the smart reusability as well. This is a unique and innovative way of getting engines back without having to keep propellant in the booster in order to get those engines back back. Now, the engines are the most expensive part of the rocket, so you can reduce costs tremendously by getting this thing back by means of an advanced inflatable heat shield. Now, they're not planning on using a mid-air capture with a helicopter anymore, but rather an oceanic recovery, and the heat shield, as most of us know, has already been tested. If you can get those engines back and reuse them, that is to say the BE-4 engines, which are designed for reuse, it reduces the overall cost significantly without reducing the payload that you can deploy, whereas SpaceX has to keep propellant and oxidizer in reserve in order to reuse the booster. It's also important to keep in mind that ULA intended to use on-orbit refueling before SpaceX made mention of it. It was only the political backers of SLS that prevented ULA from implementing this a long time ago. And of course, 
asteroid mining and expansion throughout the solar system is something that ULA and Tori Bruno have had in mind for many years. ULA is engaged in the work of making humanity a multi-planetary species every bit as much as SpaceX is. Well, okay, they aren't launching as many rockets, at least not yet, but their ideas are just as good. And all of this seemed to be very much at risk because of the unexpected event that happened to a Centaur 5 test article in Huntsville, incidentally, while I was there, but now things are back on track. And it appears that assuming there are no further unforeseen problems, including perhaps weather, we're going to have a launch of Vulcan Centaur in the early morning of December 24th. That is to say, of course, Christmas Eve. So incredibly excited about that. But it's not just the rocket itself that's important, it's also the mission. As most of us know, Vulcan Centaur is not just going to orbit on its maiden flight, it's going all the way to the moon. Powered by the primary booster and two solid rocket boosters, not the four that you're looking at right there. This is actually a simulation of the Sierra Space Launch. But we're going to be following up with the Astrobotic Peregrine Lander immediately thereafter. There it is. So the Peregrine is a lunar taxi from Astrobotic, carrying a wide variety of payloads, most of which are from NASA, but many other payloads from around the world. Let's go ahead and go through them real quick. You have the Colmena payload, which is from the AEM or Agencia Especial Mexicana, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. It's just a collection of robots from the Mexican Space Agency designed to trundle around on the lunar surface. Very small robots. You also have the Linear Energy Transfer Spectrometer from NASA designed to study the radiation levels on the lunar surface. By the way, this lander is going to be setting down at the mysterious Groithhuizen Dome and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that as well, but it's an unusual location on the moon. They're not setting it down at the lunar south pole where most of the NASA CLPS missions are going, but rather this very strange area which is covered by ancient basaltic lava flows. Now the thing about silicate lavas is they generally form only in the presence of water and in the motion of tectonic plates, neither of which exist on the moon. So how the hell did these things get there? Well, that's part of this mission's job to become the first American spacecraft to land on the lunar surface in over half a century and to explore this very mysterious region. In addition, there are other payloads from companies like Momentos to the Moon from DHL Moonbox in Germany and also Spacebit who are taking plaques and other Momentos to the surface of the moon. Also, you have the Iris Lunar Rover from Carnegie Mellon University, which is the first ever student-led lunar rover in history. And then Carnegie Mellon University is also sending something called the Moon Ark, which is a collection of works of art being sent to the surface of the moon as well. Lots of groundbreaking stuff, both in terms of technology and in terms of scientific study, but also in terms of sending important things from an artistic standpoint or just from a personal nature to the moon as well. People, for example, sending mementos to the surface of the moon or perhaps even remains of their relatives through memorial spaceflight services with Elysium Space. Other companies putting mementos and records on the moon include Memory of Mankind on the Moon from Puli Space Technologies in Hungary, also the Lunar Dream Capsule from Astroscale in Japan, who are sending messages from children around the world, along with the ARC Libraries from the ARC Mission Foundation in the United States, and finally, Footsteps on the Moon from Lunar Mission 1 in the United Kingdom. 
amazing stuff indeed. Oh, and we don't want to forget the Bitcoin Magazine Genesis plate from BTC Incorporated. All of these things going to the moon, perhaps not with any obvious scientific applications, but still significant nonetheless. And what you're watching right now is Astro Liz, who has become the first child to send a payload to the lunar surface. This is a payload that's near and dear to my heart. Astro Liz lives in Leicester in the United Kingdom, has her own nonprofit, and attracted people's attention by launching a Vulcan Centaur model from her own own backyard. Amazing stuff indeed. And of course, we wish her and this mission well. And of course, you have a wide variety of NASA payloads in addition to the ones I've already mentioned, such as the Near Infrared Volatile Spectrometer, which will be looking for a variety of different elements in the lunar regolith, including methane. Are you listening, Elon? On top of that, you have the Neutron Spectrometer, also from NASA, the M42 radiation detector from the German Aerospace Center, and the Peregrine Ion Trap Mass Spectrometer, also from NASA. That particular item is designed to characterize the lunar exosphere after descent and landing and throughout the lunar day to try to understand the release and movement of volatiles throughout the lunar environment. On top of that, you have the Laser Retro Reflector Array, also from NASA. This is designed to use reflected laser light from Earth to precisely determine the location of the Peregrine Lander. Very important for lunar navigation. You also also have the Terrain Relative Navigation System, this one from Astrobotic. This is a groundbreaking navigation system that will allow spacecraft to land on the surface of the moon with an accuracy of less than 100 meters, being used in conjunction with a LIDAR system, Navigation Doppler LIDAR that is, or NDL from NASA, which will enable Peregrine to land with unparalleled precision on the surface of the moon. Peregrine also provides a communication system for the payloads, and on top of that, a power supply that remains active even during the long lunar night. And what you're looking at right now is the south pole of the moon, where the astrobotic Viper will be looking for water ice, which is absolutely critical, indeed essential, if we want to establish a long-term presence on the moon in the future. But in order for Viper to be deployed, this mission has to go well. It is so important, not only to ULA, not only to Astrobotic, but for NASA's future ambitions of going to the moon to stay. So this mission alone is extremely important, and I hope you can see why I regard it as the most important launch of the year. That being the case, though, there are other reasons that Vulcan Centaur is important. For one thing, the second launch of Vulcan Centaur is going to be deploying the Dream Chaser spacecraft. And this, again, cannot be done by any other rocket, at least not at present, and Dream Chaser would have to be completely reconfigured to a different type of rocket if it were to be launched in the future using a different system. Vulcan's long 5.4 meter fair is one of the few that's capable of encapsulating the Dream Chaser. Falcon Heavy, even with a long fairing, cannot carry this thing, and Falcon 9 most definitely cannot. Falcon 9, in theory, could launch a crude version of Dream Chaser that doesn't require a fairing. As a matter of fact, it can't have a fairing if it is to be a safe vehicle with an abort system, but nevertheless, Tenacity can only fly on top of a Vulcan or maybe an Atlas V with some modifications, although that would have a significant impact on when Sierra Space is able to deploy this thing, which would have an impact on NASA as well, since they're planning to use this spacecraft for ISS resupply and to resupply future space stations as well. And there's one more important consideration to keep in mind when you're talking about Vulcan's capabilities, particularly on geosynchronous payloads or payloads heading to the moon.
Vulcan Centaur with solid rocket boosters has a tremendous amount of thrust and it's a very lightweight rocket at the same time. It's significantly lighter than the new Glenn rocket, but with six solid rocket boosters, it actually has more thrust than new Glenn. This is one of the reasons why new Glenn might be able to deploy 40 metric tons up to low Earth orbit, but that payload drops off dramatically to just over 13 metric tons to geosynchronous transfer orbit, whereas Vulcan can deliver 14.5 metric tons out to GTO, even though its low Earth orbit capacity is only 27.2 metric tons. What that means is it can also deliver huge payloads out to lunar orbit. We're talking 11.5 metric tons out to translunar injection orbit, substantially more than New Glenn. Substantially more even than Starship, because Starship runs out of gas pretty much by the time it reaches low Earth orbit because it's so heavy. It needs to be refueled if it's going to deliver payloads any further than LEO, whereas Vulcan is capable of delivering substantial payloads all the way out to the moon with a single launch and at a pretty reasonable price as well. This makes Vulcan extremely competitive for payloads that are going beyond low Earth orbit. And if the maiden flight of Vulcan Centaur fails, that means any hope of competition in the future also evaporates. SpaceX will continue to have a monopoly and a stranglehold on American spaceflight, which is never a good thing. Regardless of how much I might like SpaceX and the amazing things that they have accomplished, I don't trust them with a monopoly any more than I would trust ULA with a monopoly. Indeed, it's only because SpaceX broke ULA's monopoly that prices have become reasonable lately, and also the reason that ULA has decided to be competitive price-wise in the first place. If there had been no competition, spaceflight would still be impossibly expensive today, and we would have no hope of colonizing the solar system. We need the competition that Vulcan Centaur represents, which is one of the so many reasons that this upcoming flight on Christmas Eve 2023 is the most important launch of the year. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and please subscribe because there are 221,000 unique viewers that this channel has had in the last 28 days alone. I know you guys are out there. It will help this channel so much if you subscribe to it. And in addition to that, please consider joining the 17 generous folks who jumped on board with Patreon recently this month alone. It will make it so much easier for me to visit at Cape Canaveral so I can actually see this launch in person and bring you all the details as they happen. So until this rocket actually gets off the ground, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.